Welcome to Hudson Institute and uh, uh, delighted to have you here on this nice summer afternoon, almost summer afternoon, uh, and also very happy to welcome Mayor Galanos. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Um, I'm Seth Cropsey. I'm a fellow here at Hudson Institute. And uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of uh, welcoming Mayor Galanos uh, of Famagusta, uh, who will have some things to say of interest about uh, reunification efforts that uh, could be underway in Cyprus and uh, give us a somewhat detailed description of how um, how those events are moving. Um, it's a very timely discussion. Uh, the Middle East is becoming more and more volatile. Uh, it's a truism, but it's true. Um, I don't think I have to go into detail. Uh, Syria has a civil war underway that has claimed over 160,000 lives. Uh, there's a a substantial uh, reversal in Iraq's fortunes, uh, which is attended by the rise of a terrorist group, which is at least uh, in uh, public word, uh, supports a, a caliphate uh, that they say stretches from Mosul to uh, Aleppo. Um, but uh, according to uh, Pravda uh, and through the Iranian news agency, uh, the ISIS terrorist organization uh, has also expressed interest in Cyprus. Um, and that indicates um, a, uh, a longer stretch than the one that, stre that, that goes from Mosul to uh, Aleppo. So, uh, and then other regional developments that are uh, making the area increasingly volatile. Um, one can't leave out uh, the Turkish return to a what some would call a neo-form of uh, the Ottoman imperial ambition, and some would not call a neo-form, but rather the old-fashioned kind. Um, so against this um, violent, dangerous, unstable background, uh, we have uh, some democratic friends in the region, most notably um, Cyprus, uh, Israel, Greece, um, and those three states have, over the past few years, understood that they have an interest uh, in greater cooperation, uh, and that cooperation has extended um, with the United States involved in, for example, naval exercises that, are, that have now moved from uh, search and rescue to uh, more operational, uh, greater operational applicability, uh, which is to say more usefulness if there was a conflict that broke out. So signal communications, communications, interoperability uh, between um, forces of, uh, of all the countries of 
United States, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece are now on the table and being practiced regularly. That seems to me wise and prudent. Um, but the most important thing is that uh, as a counter to the region's increased instability, uh, the United States has a partner um, in the democratic coalition that, who, that is gaining strength uh, between Cyprus and Greece and Israel. Um, that's something that the United States recognizes in part, as I mentioned, by way of the multilateral naval exercises. But I think that it's something that could go a great deal further. Um, one of the things that I hope to hear from Mayor Galanos um, is about the United States backed proposal uh, that would change the status of Famagusta uh, in such a way as to uh, offer encouragement for reunification of the island. Um, that may sound on the surface like a good thing, and it may in fact at another level be a good thing, but it's a question that, uh, it's an issue that has many questions associated with it, and I expect that those questions will be at least asked here this afternoon. Um, so I would like to keep my remarks at a minimum since I am not the uh, I am neither the main course nor the dessert here. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Galanos. Welcome, please. Mr. Chairman, and uh, you allow me to call you doctors, so we have no uh, any problems. Uh, Mr. Chairman Kropsi, Dr. Fratkin, uh, our good friend uh, Aristides Karajas, our ambassador, uh, Mr. Laringages, <coughs> uh, friends, I'd like to express uh, our my appreciation and the appreciation of the two leaders in our municipality of Famagusta, the leader of the rally party and the leader of the Agel party in the municipality, uh, who accompany me, accompany me in this uh, visit to the United States. So I'd like to express the appreciation to the Hudson Institute, uh, to uh, the American Hellenic Institute, of course, uh, for this invitation and uh, the chance uh, you give me to mention a few things about the situation in Cyprus, the, my town of Famagusta, the changing world, particularly in the Middle East, the role of the uh, United States, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the alliances that are built and the, and the coalitions that can be built for the sake of uh, peace, cooperation, the roots of oil, uh, to the West, and the Western way of life, uh, to put it squarely. Uh, allow me to say that I have visited the United States many times since 1974. Uh, I was for many years, uh, and I will be very brief about myself, and I will be very brief about the whole subject. I'd like to give a chance to answer questions and uh, have a productive discussion. But I visited the United States on quite a few occasions, uh, I'm proud to say I'm one of the founders of the American Hellenic Institute, uh, together and uh, supporting Eugene Rossidis since 1974. As a member of the Cyprus Parliament and uh, for about 12 years chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of our House, and afterwards uh, president of the House of Representatives and member of Parliament for 25 years. You may ask. Uh, why mayor? My greatest honor is to be a mayor of a town like Famagusta. I returned to politics 
uh, after leaving politics to uh, get elected as mayor of Famagusta, uh, which is a symbol uh, of the, our fight for the unifying Cyprus. Famagusta is unique because big part of it, particularly the frontal and the central part of Famagusta, is uh, a ghost town. It's fenced off by the Turkish army. And it's the Turkish army, not the Turkish Cypriot administration, that uh, control uh, that part of Famagusta, which is uh, uh, on the front, as I said, on a wonderful golden beach that a lot of people remember, with a skyline of hotels looking like Miami, uh, but they are skeletons. And it's a very tragic event that after 40 years, a situation like Famagusta is allowed to continue. And the people of Famagusta, uh, who were about 50,000 in 1974, and their descendants live all, ar all around Cyprus. <clears throat> and they elect a, ma a mayor. The mayor of Famagusta is elected by the people, people who are still alive and their descendants. But uh, questions about what happened and how our elections take place and uh, uh, how things uh, are about the descendants and how we, we keep the fabric of our society together uh, and our people together with, without our town. I would like to answer them afterwards uh, because I'd like to go straight to uh, the thing and the theme uh, of this address of the role of Famagusta on the overall Cyprus problem and things are going to happen. Now, a, a very brief history uh, of uh, Famagusta as part of the Cyprus problem starts after 1974, in 1978, when uh, there was a plan for the solution to the Cyprus problem submitted by the United States government, uh, UK, and Canada, the so-called uh, American, uh, British, Canadian plan for the solution to the Cyprus problem, which unfortunately was rejected uh, by both sides. Now, uh, the, one of the main things uh, and important parts of this uh, plan was that with the opening of the talks between the community leaders, Famagusta would, be, would have been returned without any conditions. So Famagusta could have been returned since 1974. It did not happen. And I'm not going to stay long on this subject because unfortunately, I think that the one of the reasons things did not move was that we were in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, so international politics played a role uh, to, to this overall situation. The next uh, stage uh, on the question of uh, Famagusta, which was the biggest anyway, and is the biggest uh, refugee town uh, in the occupied area of Cyprus, was in 1984. Uh, I will go a little back because I will go something. The American plan was submitted as a kind of quid pro quo for the lifting of the embargo. There were two things given at the time by the USA government uh, as a kind of condition for not creating bigger problems on the lifting of the embargo. The one was the percentage of 7 to 10 as regards military aid to Turkey and Greece. And the other was the plan, particularly the question of Famagusta. The next step, uh, the next stage was 1984. Uh, <clears throat> after the declaration of independence uh, of, uh, quote, unquote, Northern Cyprus Republic, etc. Uh, that was Security Council Resolution 550, which demanded the return as a question of priority of the town of Famagusta to the Greek Cypriot side, uh, the immediate return. That, of course, was not implemented by Turkey. The next step was another United States, uh, uh, United Nations uh, Security Council Resolution <coughs> Uh, in 1992, Resolution 789, which about declared the whole area of Famagusta as a neutral zone and maybe had more importance and depth than the initial resolution of 1984-550. During that time and later, there were discussions uh, in, in the intercommunal talks about um, an exchange uh, opening the airport of Nicosia and opening Famagusta at the same time, but uh, uh, to no results. Uh, I would say the, the next step was, uh, of course, the Anna plan, which among the 
various areas to be returned, in, including the area of Amagusta, but uh, the ANA plan was not was rejected for many other reasons uh, by the majority of the Greek Cypriots. Now, it will take a long time to discuss the ANA plan and why it was rejected and uh, what games were played and who was going to accept it or reject it. Uh, but anyway, Famagusta, that was the next step. That was a little time before we started, uh, and I started as mayor of Famagusta because a lot of people expected Famagusta to be, and that was a plan of quite a few people in uh, on the Turkey side, to colonize what's left of Famagusta. Uh, that's an important area anyway, as it has tourism and strategically. We started a campaign of signatures, and about uh, 35,000 35, signatures were collected that the people of Famagusta would like to return to their homes. These signatures uh, were uh, uh, gathered in two volumes and we went all around Europe and in the States. We presented them in leaders in the Congress and we presented them to Mr. Pedrin, the uh, president of the European Parliament and to a lot of other European states, uh, projecting the question of Famagusta, which also through Famagusta, uh, we were projecting the whole problem of Cyprus. Because after 40 years, a lot of people may forget, and it's not, uh, in this world we live, the shifting sands of Arab into other places, it's very easy to forget uh, what is a refugee, who is a displaced person, and a lot of definitions. Uh, but what is very difficult to forget and to write off, it's a whole town that lies there, uh, a skeleton, a ghost town, a vision for the future, maybe. Uh, this is a, a testament of cruelty and the testament of a continuous problem. Uh, crisis in the world, they are only translated nowadays with blood, bloodshed and hardship. Uh, the weakness on the Cyprus issue, and of course we are lucky we don't have more blood, and more victims, but the question of a ghost town makes up uh, for the continuous tragedy that could easily be forgotten after all these years if it were not uh, for the picture we all see of August. We come to the present situation, and uh, what I'm glad to say is that after many years at the uh, uh, United States, and particularly after the Annan Plan, uh, there wasn't a, a very active involvement. We expect a more involvement from Europe, and as far as Europe is concerned, of course, uh, we had the Ankara Protocol and obligations of from the part of Turkey that uh, were never fulfilled. But the United States have shown a very active interest, uh, I would say, the last one, two years. There are possibly many reasons uh, uh, for this interest. Uh, personally, I think that uh, the very good and increasingly strengthening relations uh, between Cyprus and Israel in a world of terrorism and in a world of instability that uh, the chairman has described before and in, in a world where we don't know who are our friends and who are our enemies and who and whether the friends of our enemies are our friends and they can continue to be our friends uh, is very difficult uh, to decide so we see the beginning and the strengthening of a coalition, as mentioned, I would say a peaceful alliance, which is based on common principles, uh, the rule of law as regards nations, uh, but also economic interest. Uh, maybe United States are not so dependent in, anymore on uh, the producer countries in the Middle East uh, with the discoveries, uh, particularly the use of technology the fracking, as we say, in the United States. Uh, but uh, Middle East uh, remains a very important part of the world, particularly if things develop in a negative way. And this is where the importance of Turkey, for instance, and you cannot refute that, uh, lies on the fact that a country which is close uh, and follows Western mentality as it's presented is allied with the United States. But of course, we have seen the last few years uh, an effort to establish a neo-Ottoman uh, empire, a neo-Ottoman neo aspirations of, Tur of Turkey, 
uh, abandoning uh, its uh, aspirations towards Europe, or maybe realizing that it's not easy to join the European Union, uh, and they could develop a very special relationship with Europe, but not to the point of joining Europe, realizing that, uh, preferring uh, to establish a, a regional uh, leadership role. This, of course, uh, has failed in the last few years with the changes that are happening. Uh, the relations of Turkey and Israel have become more difficult, although one could say the mirror has cracked, but has not been destroyed. Uh, because the interests, uh, deep, deep down interests, do not allow otherwise. But as I said before, we see a strengthening of relationships between Cyprus, Israel, and Greece, based, uh, I will use the word, realistic factors, but also uh, an identity uh, of approach, uh, and the realization that uh, this relationship can only bring benefits to the people around. I will not go back and mention that we uh, went through uh, difficult times uh, with the role of Cyprus in the non-aligned and uh, what was happening with the Arab countries. I will only go back as far as far as is concerned, from where our camps, uh, exodus, uh, started from the camps of uh, Jewish people who were living in Famagusta and moved uh, to Israel and started the state of Israel. And uh, we are proud, and we remember that many times, that uh, Exodus started from the area of Famagusta. Anyway, uh, this is digressing. Uh, I'm going back about the, the present uh, situation. Uh, United States are more involved in the Cyprus issue. Uh, we have seen the visit of the Vice President Biden in Cyprus. He made a very correct and dubbed statement there. Uh, he put it clearly that there is only one state to be recognized, and this is the state of Cyprus. Nobody will recognize any runaway republic. And uh, United States got involved on the issue of Famagusta, and uh, this is very hopeful for us, by joining our efforts and uh, promoting a very simple, uh, but I think useful, proposal that as, as a step towards uh, uh, reunifying the whole area of Famagusta, where Greek Cypriots and Turkey Cypriots live, and creating a stepping stone for the reunification of Cyprus, American U United States experts should be allowed to enter the fenced off area and make a study of how to rebuild and how to reunify this area. This, of course, involves during rebuilding the opening of the port of Famagusta, which will be great benefit uh, for the Turkish Cypriots under European rules. And, of course, uh, rebuilding uh, and restoring the stones of Famagusta, the old town of Famagusta, which is a world monument, if you ask me. It's a very historic place through, through where many and very strong and all civilizations of Europe have passed through, and Turkey Cypriots are the keepers of the keys. Unfortunately, this very simple proposal that have helped psychologically the climate to improve and make uh, majorities uh, in Cyprus believe that uh, we can reverse the clock and can reunify the island, and Cyprus as a whole can play a very important role in the area, uh, has been rejected uh, with a very, I would say, I use the expression, unreasonable uh, counter proposal that Turkish Cypriot experts should help the United States experts in their study. And of course, we are talking about rebuilding uh, the Greek part of Famagusta before rebuilding the whole area. That refusal was was something unexpected for us and could never be expected. Anyway, uh, some friends are looking at their watch 
and I realized that uh, I reached uh, the time limit. And I would like to give more time for questions and answers rather than uh, just speaking about a subject that you know that we can talk for hours. And uh, I have a lot of notes here to mention, which some of which are relevant, some of which may not be relevant. Uh, but uh, all these details uh, make the uh, make the whole issue of Amagusta important. And I like to repeat it and uh, say it very clearly that Famagusta for us is very important that uh, as a, a game changer for the solution to the Cyprus problem. There is no ambition uh, to return to a town that is isolated and be enclaved uh, without any economic future. The ambition of the return from Augusta is an ambition to reunify Cyprus and uh, reap the benefits of reunification for the whole of Cyprus. And there from Augusta can be very important uh, for Cyprus economy and Cyprus future, etc., by itself returning uh, that part and rebuilding it, which will take 10 years, is something that will not work. So, uh, Famagusta is a process. Uh, it's only positive the return of Famagusta because it will bring benefits for the solution of the Cyprus problem. And this is how we mean it, and this is how it can be. An argument that you know we return uh, Famagusta is returned and. For, uh, uh, the, the people from Worcester return to their homes, nobody will be interested in anything else. It's a false argument because it works for nobody. Uh, and this argument, unfortunately, is being used uh, because there is no political will for a solution to the problem. So I'd like to end this uh, address first by thanking again the Hudson Institute for the chance uh, to speak about Famagusta and the Cyprus issue. Secondly, uh, I'd like to express the appreciation for the involvement of uh, uh, United States government and Congress all these years, and uh, to our friends who have helped the Cyprus issue for all these years. Uh, there is one thing, and there is not a question of being patriots, uh, pro, pro solution or no solution. Cyprus can have a future if we resolve the issue. Cyprus can have a future if we reunify the island. Otherwise, uh, we will be exposed to a thousand dangers as an island. And Cyprus, while it is destined to be a bridge for peace and the paragon of stability in the area, uh, its own division will not help achieve this role. This is recognized by uh, the people who are in power in the United States we hope it's recognized in Europe, and as far as we are concerned, as Cypriots, as members of the European family, and as members of the Western family, we'll continue working uh, because we have this ambition for our island. So thank you very much. So. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. I imagine there'll be questions. I know there'll be questions from me. Um, it seems to me that uh, reunification, as desirable as it is, uh, has to take into account uh, Turkey um, and the Turkish regime these days is um, increasingly problematic. So m my question is, uh, what does reunification look like um, with Turkey in its current political direction? What does that mean for, for we, Cyprus? We pray, because maybe a little longer we pray. Of course, I could uh, reply in two words, but I will not uh, reply in two words, that uh, better the devil uh, you know than the devil uh, you don't know. But I will not uh, give this very brief reply. Uh, nobody denies that uh, in Turkey, we have a very 
autocratic government and uh, a ruler of Turkey who is a disappointment to those friends who supported him. And those friends who were the first uh, to visit him. Of course, we cannot um, really try, it's not easy to understand uh, what's happening in a place like Turkey in terms uh, of what we know as Western democracy. Uh, after all, what happened in Turkey, we see that Mr. Erdogan took uh, almost 50% of the vote. So what for us, and it is not democratic and autocratic, uh, in Turkey, in some parts of the world, there is a different uh, approach. Uh, there are states that, uh, I'm being very frank with you, that are encouraging uh, terrorism, but who are our friends? Because we have, uh, I'm talking when I say we have friends, friends of the West. Uh, there are friends uh, who are involved with Sunni, Shiite, Muslims. You never know what's going to happen. Who was supporting ISIS? That now is a very big problem in Iraq. And who, and who is our enemy now? So these are difficult questions. Uh, the, the thing of the reunification of Cyprus, our hope is that uh, Mr. Erdogan uh, may realize that uh, allowing the reunification of Cyprus, uh, that will definitely uh, uh, in, enhance his position in the Western family and create conditions of stability and help Turkey itself to reintegrate uh, in, uh, the, uh, in, in, the, in the affairs that were happening before uh, after, I suppose, a failed policy of uh, a, new, a new Ottoman Empire. Uh, we hope that uh, this will be his approach and uh, I hope that the United States and Europe will be fair on this condition. So we, we look at this, uh, at the unification in these terms, but uh, I, will, uh, I will also put, like to put one question. And what, is, what is the alternative? Because if we accept, uh, and if we say that Mr. Erdogan is uh, the man that we all see and uh, know what he's doing, putting in prison many journalists uh, and uh, the way he's uh, facing uh, his own public and the protest in his country, and a lot of other things. Uh, shall we say that uh, the people who follow uh, in power Mr. Erdogan will be better as regards the Cyprus issue and as regards the relations with the West? We have invested a lot of hopes in the Arab, uh, in the Arab Spring. We see what's happening. Therefore, <laughs> what I say is uh, whatever happens in Turkey, it will be a good thing uh, for the reunification of Cyprus and this alliance to be built and somehow Turkey get into the picture through the roots of oil to the West. I know there may be alternatives, but uh, if we look at the positive side, and uh, definitely we suffer from the Turkish invasion and we are the first to say that the Cyprus issue uh, is a matter of, is not a question of two communities which artificially started after some promises we got from friends abroad uh, that we should start on the way of negotiations that would help the solution, that was the opposite. So the Cyprus issue is a question of the rule of law, international law, invasion, invasion, people may say that it was intervention, occupation, violation of human rights, etc. And what's the result after 40 years? So what we like to see and try to see positively is that the Cyprus issue and the solution to the Cyprus issue will be a contribution to peace in the area uh, and a change for the better in the relations uh, of countries that can help and that can play an important role towards peace. So we like to see it this way rather than in a way of confrontation. Uh, we are a very small country to play a big role in any confrontation. Uh, we have to realize that. So let us hope that a peaceful settlement of the Cyprus issue uh, will herald uh, a better situation and stability in the Middle East and the war against terrorism. This is how Mr. Chairman would like to. 
ask you a question. And if I did not answer it, uh, please ask me another question to uh, not to evade the question. But I started saying that Erdogan, he is the man. Uh, we know what he, what he's doing, how he's behaving. Uh, but what is the alternative for the president after 40 years? I, I don't have so much hope that Mr. Erdogan will see the light, but we have to try, because after 50 and 60 years, uh, we'll be running memories. And uh, Famagusta may not be a municipality li like to think we are. Uh, we will be, you know, a club of veterans. Mr. Larangagis. I, 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 let's, uh, uh, in, I'm not going to conduct this dialogue by myself, so let's throw the questions, uh, the floor open to questions and, uh, or questions from the floor. And uh, if you would be so good as to identify yourself um, and ask the question when we will bring a microphone to you, right? Right. Nikola Regakis, president of the American Hellenic Institute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cropsley, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, being here in Washington. I know you had a tremendous visit here this week, meeting members in the government, State Department, on Capitol Hill, pressing this message, which is very important. As we stand here 40 years later, a NATO army continues to occupy a sovereign country called the Republic of Cyprus, which happens to be also in the European Union. So you have a NATO army occupying a member of the European Union, and just on the face of itself, it's, it's ridiculous, and the whole Western world and, and the free world should be up in arms about it. Notwithstanding that, of course, and the recent uh, interest by the Vice President of the United States uh, on visiting Cyprus and some of the comments that he has shared privately with some members of our community and his interest in this, um, and regarding Famagusta itself, uh, where you're looking for the United States to come in and to conduct the surveys and so forth, there are still two other elements at play here, and I was wondering if you can please tell us what you're pursuing and, and what they're telling you regarding uh, Famagusta, and that is, this would be under UN auspices, as I understand it. So what, would the U what is the UN saying regarding this? What is Ba Ki-moon saying regarding this? Where is the pressure coming from the UN regarding uh, Famagusta? And what is that organization called the European Union, which Turkey continues to violate, okay, it's Ankara Protocol, but yet has been, you know, agreed for negotiations to the European Union, even though they've been frozen, they did violate the Ankara Protocol. And I'd like to hear more from what the European Union is doing regarding uh, trying to create a, a better uh, environment uh, for the Famagusta issue. Thank you, Mr. Larangagis. Uh, let me say first and very clearly, uh, for us, the big objective, and this is what we will fight on, and on and on, before the return of any Famagusta, is the withdrawal of the Turkish troops from the island of Cyprus, from any part of the world, particularly a European country. And if we look at Famagusta, we look at that as a way to start a process that will get to that. The second thing, no guarantees from anybody. Cyprus does not need any guarantees. No European country should have needed guarantor powers. The third thing, terminate any settlements, any legal settlement, and the status of illegal immigration, the demographic changes that are killing any process after 40 years. And if we try to get a solution, it's because after 50 years, I don't know, maybe it's also it's irreversible even now, but after 50 years, we will not deal with uh, Turkish Cypriots. And we have other problems. So we try to stop the rot, what is happening. First thing. Second thing, United Nations. United Nations is a very useful institution. Has, succeed, has succeeded the League of Nations. We know what happened to the League of Nations. United Nations, you know the videos, you know how they work, you know that the decisions are important, but there is a difficulty in implementing decisions. You like me to mention examples? I will not, because I may touch sensitivities. Same goes for the Security Council and the videos that can be used in the Security Council to do nothing about it. So United Nations uh, maybe temporarily they stopped any further uh, bloodshed blood in Cyprus with their presence. 
but their presence also, and I, I don't say they have the division, but they send the message of division. The United Nations by themselves, they cannot solve the Cyprus issue. And Turkey cannot obey, accept United Nations resolutions in the world we live. Only countries that can influence and can put pressure on Turkey, and they can link their own interests with the interests of Turkey. And there is an overall uh, uh, alliance of interests can put the pressure on Turkey to withdraw from Cyprus. And this is where we look to the United States. We should have looked to Europe. But uh, Europe is suffering from its own problems, its own, let's say, dilemmas, its own policy, whether uh, they should adopt policies I'm against them that made the Weimar Republic and they're making the Southern Europe today, or whether they should look at the European project in the mentality of a Marshall Plan to allow Europe to get together and uh, achieve the objective that we all had as Europeans of the United States of Europe, which is not succeeding because some people, including people in Germany, I say it very clearly, uh, they don't look at it in a, in a big way, uh, with a vision, with a foreign policy that Europe should exercise, not only in Cyprus, in the whole area, but they look at it on the basis of economic, narrow economic interest. And this is why we see the situation as it is in Europe. So again, in Europe, I don't say like United Nations, but they cannot implement their decisions. And of course, Turkey is not so dependent on Europe as we think, because in Turkey they realize that they cannot join the European Union. And there is strong objection for reasons we all understand Turkey to join the European Union. And Turkey has used European Union, Mr. Erdogan, in order to achieve his own reforms and uh, face the problem with the military. So they know that, and they follow their own, pol their own policy. We don't know now, with the situation as it develops, which is not so favorable for Turkey in the area, whether they will turn against Europe for a privileged uh, relationship. But of course, Europe should have taken its full responsibilities on the Cyprus issue. They haven't. And uh, uh, the position of the Turkish side, uh, when we demanded, we asked for a European uh, observer, uh, European Union to play a role in the talks that they have started, the reply we got from uh, the Commission and the European rulers is, uh, you know, we'll do it if both the two sides accept it. It's wrong because they, there is only one government in Cyprus. They recognize only one territory in Cyprus. I would say the big majority of the Turkish Cypriots, they have European passports. Uh, big funds every year, they reach uh, the northern part of Cyprus from Europe. But they accept because they don't want to get involved. This kind of argument is a silly argument that, uh, you know, uh, we don't recognize Europe. If the other part of the island, they don't recognize Europe, why do they, uh, do they have European passports? So, you see, we live in a world of, uh, you know, big things, uh, big beliefs, uh, idealism. But what's ha happening in reality uh, is hypocrisy. The one country that can really play a role with Turkey uh, today as things stand is the United States. And we like it or not, I don't want to minimize the importance of other countries in the world. But the United States has leverage. And if the United States get involved, we think that eventually Europe can get involved. So we have to welcome the involvement of the United States and we have to insist that uh, what the United States are trying to do and help on Famagusta must continue because it's a way to go ahead. And another thing I like to say it for everybody to hear. We are in such a bad position in Cyprus. And do you all believe, and do we know what we are, and we don't have a problem of identity? It's high time to stop giving each other uh, credentials of patriotism. The one goal we have, and only, is the end of the Turkish occupation of Cyprus. If we have to go through hell, we go through hell to achieve it. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Krapsi. My name is Anthony Livenio. I'm uh, living in Frankfurt, Germany, 
with Energy Stream Company, an oil and gas advisory firm. Mayor Galanos, thank you very much for your presentation. I did not hear anything about natural gas. And natural gas is the elephant right now sitting in the room. It's a game changer in many of us that we work on the natural gas industry. How do you see natural gas achieving stability in the region, in a highly unstable region? How do you see the emerging relationship between Israel, the most important ally of the United States, to end with Cyprus, this new emerging strategic partnership that the two countries are developing, affect the, the, the stability in the region and the solution to the Cyprus problem? How do you see natural gas playing a role? What is your vision? How your country can become more prosperous, more stable, by really exploring and developing natural gas? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. I touched on the subject, but uh, of course I was talking about Famagusta, so I didn't want to enlarge on the question of natural gas. And uh, I, I thought that uh, Mr. Lacodribis, our Minister of Commerce who visited the United States, and Minister of Energy talked about it. But first thing I'd like to say, I don't want to count my chicken before having them. Second thing, you mentioned the elephant. Agreed, but not to have an elephant in a tea shop. Uh, so what I want to say is that natural gas uh, and all things that have to do with energy can be not only a blessing, but can also be a curse. We have to be very careful about it. We have found natural gas, but uh, we only had one hole. We want to see what's happening, and it will take a few years for natural gas to develop. Uh, we don't know what the price is going to be. I don't want to understate the case of uh, natural gas, but I, I don't want also to overstate it. We cannot rely, we cannot depend on our future on whether and uh, what is uh, what we can get from natural gas, and I would say what we can get from natural gas must go to the future gener generations. And we have a very important example that of Norway, and we have to do it like that. We cannot build our, all our hopes on natural gas. On the other hand, yes, I see the very importance, particularly after what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in the world, the needs of Europe, the needs of Turkey as regards consumption of oil and energy. I see how important Cyprus can become and how important the alliance with Israel and the, uh, the, 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 the neighboring plots we have in Lebanon and, and Egypt. I see all this potential, but I, we cannot build a future of a country, uh, a political future of a country, a country that has a problem of foreign troops on the hope that natural gas will solve every problem. Because on the other hand, uh, I hope the United States will continue a firm policy protecting the oil companies that are, exp they are exploring natural gas and not allow Turkish threats as it has uh, natural gas. But we have to take everything into consideration and uh, definitely we are brave, but no bravados. Uh, so it's important. It's important and we have to verify that. And I like to know what I talk about. Uh, I don't want to build false hopes about Ireland. Uh, and another thing about natural gas and energy, Turkey can be a very important consumer, but also I believe that for a lot of Western countries, the roots and the pipes may be more important than natural gas itself. So we have to see them together. And if uh, they are identity of interest. We are ready to see it, provided uh, people put aside uh, illogical ambitions uh, and uh, nationalism and hatreds and look to the future and the future generations and not live in the past. By living in the past, we will not get the future. Uh, there's a question. Hi, my name is Bahri Ali Riz. I'm president for Polytrade International Corp. 
and I'm also the president for Northern Cyprus Cultural Society. Uh, my uh, question: the, the last presidency, Northern I Cyprus Cultural Society. Right. My uh, question to you, sir, is uh, if you can uh, explain a little bit about what the Akritas plan is uh, about the extermination of the Turkish population, uh, Turkish Cypriot population on the island, and how it led to the uh, the Turkish troops to come to the island and when the president of Cyprus, Makarios, went to the United Nations and pleaded for help because Greeks were actually killing Greeks. If you could uh, explain that. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm not here to start, uh, you know, the usual polemics uh, and uh, put on an equal footing. Uh, the troubles uh, that were inside Cyprus with the you say intervention, I say invasion. We are allowed to differ, and I beg to differ, of the Turkish army. And I don't want to talk about missing people and what happened over there and the replacement. Displacement. I don't want to do that. But I want to say that whatever happened, why do they continue uh, for 40 years having these troops? Uh, do you see? Any bloodshed uh, in Cyprus or any possibility that there will be a war in Cyprus uh, between uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots? Only the other day we signed we signed an agreement with the Turkish Cypriot mayor and I recognize, although one would say uh, he's a mayor of an illegal regime, I recognize that he's a mayor as per the 1960 constitution for the return of Famagusta, as per United Nations resolutions, the opening of the, the port and the European rules, and the restoring of the town. So I don't see any reason for me having a Turkish troops in the island to start with, and I don't see any reason for having settlers in the island. And I visited, and they have seen the blocks of buildings uh, for the settlers. I don't see any reason for that. Um, we don't have to fight a war, Turkey and Greece, uh, and Greek Cypriots against Turkish Cypriots. Uh, there are more important issues as regards economy, the future of our children. We have to end all this, what happened and who happened and who is to blame and whatever it is. We have United Nations resolutions, we have European Union resolutions, we have all these things. Let's leave them be beyond us. And let's look whether we can achieve uh, things for the future. Otherwise, we live in the past. So I have to explain. I don't have to explain. You have your interpretation, I have mine. Uh, everybody can understand that. Are we going to discuss for another 50 years who is doing to what to whom? Or what we will do together? Is Turkey going to join the European family and be there? Or are we going to play games in that area? Uh, and at the same time, the only people who gain are the terrorists, who do not belong in, our, in these nations anyway. My friend. Louis Intellecte, I'm a naval veteran, and uh, part of this discussion is about maritime, American maritime power. Much of our fighting men in the Navy are black. Um, the civil rights here is uh, 50 years old, roughly. Um, and that brings my question, because as I listen to you, what I was trying to grapple with is the identification of a Cypriot. And um, how do you identify a Cypriot? Are you guys white, black, Jewish, Greek, Hispanic, Iberian, Christian, Jew. Um, I hear white, I, I hear um, Cypriots, and then I hear Turkish Cypriots. And as I listen to you, the question that ebbed in my mind is, if you get reunification, what happens to the Turkish Cypriot? And how do you justify non-intervention slash non-invasion if the Turkish Cypriots do not have a podium of strength from which to protect their rights? That's my question. How do you identify United States? A pot boiler. We are Cypriots of Greek descent and I'm very happy I'm very proud of my Greek descent, and my name is Alexandros, Alexander, and I'm not great, but I'm 
Capi for my name. And my wife is Alexandra. And they have a son who is Alexandra. So I identify myself <laughs> with the history. And the same goes with the Cypriot of Turkish descent. Yes, Cypriots. So I think the culture and the tradition and the roots, whatever you want to say about our roots, everybody has his own roots. And the, the roots is what you believe. We make believe. Let's make believe. The thing is to believe in the roots, whatever it is. The same goes for Turkey, Cyprus, and whoever is there. And this made the United States. And this is why we agreed to a federation in Cyprus. And this is the example. So let's stay on that. And uh, I'm a great believer. Uh, he fought wars. He made a lot of mistakes. But I'm a great believer in Eleftherios Venizelos, who made peace with Kemal Atatürk after fighting a war. I believe that people uh, should live together. If we look in the universe, we are a little spot like that. I will continue all these fights. Uh, we are giving a very bad legacy to our children. Uh, I would like to, for uh, my children not to grow up with the same prejudices and haters we had. So let's leave this question of who is God. Is God we believe in and what we, if I, we, and what we fight for. And to fight for a reunified European Cyprus. Herschel Shanks, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review. Uh, shall I repeat that? Could you please? I'm Herschel Shanks, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review. And as I naively listen to the discussion uh, here and, and uh, other discussions, it seems to me uh, maybe naive, but the, the idea of unifying Cyprus uh, seems to be uh, in the clouds. So, um, that, that's the basis of my question. And I'd like to ask you to uh, give us a little update on what I call the unity of Cyprus on the ground. I think over the years, there has been much, uh, much more openness between North and South, and there's uh, the economic interchange has uh, improved. And uh, you can go back and forth more easily. And uh, I, I just wonder if we put the legalities aside, uh, what is the situation? Can, can we develop a kind of unity uh, or uh, an openness on the ground? Is that more realistic uh, than an attempt to unify it legally? Uh. I take it as a biblical question no, uh, no, that, 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 the, that the unity of Cyprus is in the, in the clouds uh, is biblical. <laughs> why, why not? Uh, why not? The people, the people, the people, the people, the Cyprus uh, was never divided. Uh, what happened last last 40 years? Why not? Uh, what is? Uh, it's a small island. Uh, why not have, have the legality? Uh, and of course, human rights and all this protection comes out of legality. But the Turkish Cypriots also would like to be belong to a legal entity. I would. I, I believe that the majority of the Turkish Cypriots want legality, want the state. They, do they want, let's say, all their life to live under the shadow of Turkey? And uh, I will mention one thing to you. Uh, all right, one thing may not be appear after 40 years, uh, be, appears as a difficult proposition, and nobody will say it's an easy proposition. But what is the alternative? Do you think that things will continue uh, in the present status quo, that uh, there will be a recognized state and uh, another, let's say, entity without recognition, the recognition of Turkey, and with settlers coming all day, all the time, and the Turkey Cypriots living, no. That part of Cyprus will be absorbed by Turkey. And I, there is a great possibility. Uh, I like to believe there is a greater possibility that we, are, with mutual concessions, we achieve this reunification. 
And uh, I think this unification will keep both the two sides more honest. I don't want to analyze it. Uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, there is a possibility. Uh, we are not far away. I mean, on the constitutional issue, things are closed. Once uh, we have accepted the future existence of a bi-regional bi -regional federation, and uh, we know what federation means. We know what and where the residual powers can go and what the central government can do. We know about how the legislature will operate, and we have examples of that. So we have some problems there, uh, which are also problems of international law. Uh, it's a problem of troops. No, uh, I don't think that's in the cloud to ask for troops to withdraw. Sometimes it's a mistake that they withdraw. They may think of going back. I, don't, I will not mention an example. Uh, the question of settlements. No, we are changing the demography. So what are the difficult things? The difficult things, yes, is uh, what areas will be in each state. That will be negotiated. Uh, there are some outlines on that. And the number of refugees that they would like to go back. And the fact that each separate province, not to use the word state, uh, will have the majorities. These are the things that can be done. Uh, the property issue is a difficult one. But there is also international law on the property issue. So I think that uh, I, I see your point that there are some difficulties. But if, if we did not have a chance, why should we negotiate after 40 years? Why should they negotiate? Uh, why should we care to get involved? Uh, do we play a blame game for whom? Are we getting more prosperous with the situation as it is? No. Cyprus is uh, dependent on the European aid, as things happened, which were very our side, which were very unfair, in our opinion. Turkey and Cyprus side are dependent on Turkey. Cyprus, as mentioned before, can be very prosperous. You will find oil, which be, will be used for both the two communities once we have a solution. So I don't think it's difficult. It's difficult, but I think that with the involvement of friends to assist us, it can happen. Europe got reunified. The United States went through a civil war. Other countries were reunified. Uh, we have seen what happened in Yugoslavia. So uh, I agree with you on one thing. We are close to make or break. I think for the benefit of both the two communities, and that's why we are here, it's make. If not, we have wasted 40 years. I have wasted. I'm afraid that we have, well, we have time for one more question. Is that too late? Is, uh, you must not uh, yes. refuse to take, uh, come put it together. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for being here. My name is Alexia Chambers. I work with the Diplomatic Courier, and I was actually a student on the AHI foreign policy trip, so I was able to visit Panama Gusta. It was a really incredible experience for me. Um, I'm just wondering, with the accelerated process of reunification, now with the discovery of natural gas, I wonder, do you think this um, increased involvement, I guess you could say, of the United States and other nations to resolve the reunification issue um, might put together kind of a slapstick or hurried resolution in, in the interest of making the space available once the natural gas is available to kind of say, okay, we're ready to hit the ground running. Do you think maybe we're putting uh, Cyprus, um, on, well, the Republic of Cyprus and really all parties involved in a foreign policy straitjacket by putting together a hurried resolution? I have to um, make an admission. You asked the question very quickly and I'm a little deaf. So if you can just, in two words, real. I apologize. The process has been accelerated lately because of the discovery of natural gas. And I wonder, because of that acceleration, do you think maybe we're putting together a plan that's a little bit hurried, that could put Cyprus in a foreign policy straitjacket uh, later on down the line? Well, a very important answer is that um, we are in a hurry. Thanks to if it's thanks to natural gas that we're in a hurry, we are in a hurry. Because generations, oh, they leave us. 
the younger generations, uh, uh, they may not be have, they not, may not have the memories of unity and what could happen. So it's high time to put a little haste. Otherwise, uh, I tell you something: the people who gain more, present people, of course, not, not included, are people who made a profession out of the Cyprus issue. Professional politicians, professional people, uh, there are not many, but some. Uh, uh, we, we don't want to see the issue as a profession to continue discussing about the Cyprus issue. Happy people are the people who have no, hi who have no story, no history, story. So this story of the continuous division of the island and uh, you know the accusations and what's happening all the time and uh, having, I would like to come here to the Hudson Institute next time and talk about uh, the benefits of oil uh, and talk about international problems and not Cyprus. We have been talking too much. So yes, there is some haste on that. This doesn't mean that we will accept anything out of haste or out of the economic situation in Cyprus as it is today, no. Those people who think that they will, no. But the sense of haste, yes, we must have a, haste of haste, a sense of haste because time is running out. Uh, time is working against, uh, I agree with you on this, my friend. Time is working against. Uh, reunifying Cyprus. Time is working against what is good. But we, we like all in all our life to believe in the power of good, not in the power of evil, which is the vision of an island, and continue this kind of uh, uh, confrontation. Uh, Cyprus is not there to have a confrontation uh, among its people. Cyprus is there to be a bridge for the confrontation of others. This should be the role of Cyprus. Hey, Galanis, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, coming here this afternoon. Your excellent remarks. Uh, and uh, also to you in the audience for your thoughtful questions and uh, good listening. And I'd also like to express my hopes for uh, the growth and flourishing of democracy and security um, on this most strategically located island in the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again at another Hudson event. Thank you once again.